Exam review. What's going on, smart people? I'm hella tired right now, but I took my qualifying exam. It's already in the past. It's over. Something that I've been preparing for weeks for is finally done with. Let's talk about how it went. I've mentioned before all the stuff about the qualifying exam. It's an eight-hour test that tests you on four different sections. Classical mechanics, thermodynamics, electricity and magnetism, and quantum mechanics. And uh, the way that it was structured today is it's four sections and each section has three questions and out of those three questions for each section you choose two to do so it's eight questions total what was actually kind of nice is instead of them saying here's eight hours and there's your four sections have at it instead they split it up into two sections so the first section was classical mechanics and thermodynamics and you had four hours for that then there was an hour break and then four hours to do quantum and E and M. So for this, I'm gonna give more of a qualitative description on the types of problems, not like actual numbers, because I would get really bored with that and I can't be bothered, as well as just how I felt about each, uh, each section. So I started off with thermodynamics and with the three questions, there was one on, uh, there was one that was multiple parts that was like Fermi energy and Fermi pressure and then also a black body problem. So it was like, here's the temperature of a star, here's a planet this far away, assume everything's fine, uh, calculate the surface temperature of that planet from the sun, which was really easy. So that one was kind of a freebie. The next one, if you've had any thermodynamics, you know it's a course on partial derivatives and holding different things constant, and that's what that next problem was. It was calculating all of these partial derivative relations. I said, uh uh, I'm gonna opt out of that one. And the last question, which I did do, was uh, it was like a reverse Carnot engine problem. So it was like a refrigerating problem. So that one was, was pretty easy. Overall, I felt really good about the thermodynamics section. Um, the next section was, uh, well, it was the same group, but I did uh, the classical mechanics exam. And for the classical mechanics, again, three questions, choose two to do. The first one was, um, it was actually kind of tricky not necessarily tricky, but I read it wrong. I read it wrong and I solved a harder problem and had to fix my mistake later on. So you had two carts that were compressing a spring on some elevation and uh, they both had equal mass and then at some time t equals zero, oh, by the way, they're also moving with some initial velocity. And at some time t equals zero, you let go and the spring uh, you know, pushes the carts, and it's a one-time thing, the springs aren't connected, so the potential energy is like a constant. I read it as the spring being rigidly connected to the two carts, and the question said to find the distance between the carts as a function of time. So in my solution, I had this oscillatory solution for the distance between them, because when I wrote down the Lagrangian, I had the, the potential energy stored in the spring dependent on the position of the two things instead of just being a constant and then I had to go back and fix my mistake. The next problem after that, so that one was actually pretty straightforward. I just took the long way around and gave myself harder differential equations to solve. But the next problem was uh, they gave you some central potential and it was weird. Some components of velocity at different points of something's trajectory and it asked to deduce whether or not that particle would escape the orbit or if it would be bound or not. As I mentioned before, orbits are kind of my weak point, so that was the one I opted out of for the classical mechanics section. And the third problem was, uh, it was actually pretty straightforward, but I wasn't quite sure where the first step was supposed to be because it was a gravitational force problem, but they wanted you to derive the, the you know, g m1 m2 over r squared, and I was like, huh, well, I, I could say that it's the gradient of some potential, but is the potential thing already assuming the nature of the force? I didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to have any circular reasoning or anything like that. So instead, what I did is I took Poisson's equation. I took the Laplacian of the potential and set it proportional to the mass density. And then I guessed this, I expanded that out in spherical coordinates and had this power series guess and then worked my way to the solution, which worked out pretty well. Um, if you haven't noticed by now, I typically take the long way around. There's probably a simpler way of doing that. The, actually, no, that was classical mechanics. Cool, already done. So classical mechanics and thermodynamics, I feel really good about. I think I had a pretty solid grasp. There might be an error just because I found out that I read the uh, potential energy thing wrong initially pretty late in the game. So I tried to, you know, tidy it up as best I could. 
but I left the solution for the the rigid connected thing. So like maybe maybe they'll feel. I mean that's a harder problem because it's actually oscillating. Anyways, I felt good about those sections. Then there was the hour break, and then we got into quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. I started with um, what did I start with? I started with quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanics, the first question, they gave you some Hamiltonian and some function, and they said the Hamiltonian was in terms of the square of the Z component of angular momentum. Sorry if you haven't had any of these courses yet and I'm just speaking gibberish right now, but you know, it's, it's an exam review of a qualifying exam. We're gonna have to be a little bit specific. But the Hamiltonian was in terms of the square of the Z component of the angular momentum operator, and it was we were told to show that this function they gave us was an eigenstate to both the Hamiltonian and the Z component. That was super easy. Then they gave you this uh, this time this function at t equals zero, and said they used the time evolution operator to uh, find the wave function at a later point in time. So if you're familiar with the time evolution operator, that was pretty straightforward too. So that's one of the ones that I did. Oh, the second one was just solving the Schrodinger equation for a delta function potential and proving and deriving the uh, like continuity conditions for the derivatives of the wave function and the regular wave function at that interesting point. And then the final question, which I opted out of, was a variational methods one. So it was like proving Ritz variational principle and a whole bunch of things where I would have had to plug in a bunch of numbers, which I couldn't be bothered to do. So I decided not to do that one. Plus it had like six parts to it. And finally, we are left off with E and M. It was the last topic of the qualifying exam. And I gotta say, this was definitely the most challenging part, almost objectively. After speaking to the other grad students, we were like, damn, that part was kind of hard, I, I, I gotta admit. Uh, so the first problem, you, you were given some molecule and some atoms with certain polarizabilities, and it was we were asked to construct the polarizability tensor. And right off the bat, I'm like, I don't know what the polarizability tensor is. I'm a huge tensor boy, don't get me wrong. So I was thinking, well, I know of the polarization vector that's in terms of the electric susceptibility tensor and the electric field. Uh, maybe what they want me to do is to construct some polarization vector for the atoms and then take the tensor product and maybe that's what they're talking about. No, turns out what I call the electric susceptibility tensor, they were calling the polarizability tensor. Um, so that was one of the ones that I attempted to solve and I used a lot of logic and reasoning to try to argue the nature of the tensor and whether it was symmetric or not. Um, so I, I think I explained, based off of what they gave me, I explained what I could deduce from that system. Uh, and I had things in terms of the electric susceptibility tensor. I just didn't think that that was the end of the road. So I don't, there's no way I got full credit for that. That was kind of a bummer. The next question, we had a particle traveling through a parallel plate capacitor at some velocity, and we were told to place the conditions to find out the conditions such that the uh, particle will travel approximately in a straight line. So V has to be much less than or much greater than what in order for this to happen. And then it asked uh, to find out what radiation it will emit due to this to this whole this whole event going on. And then finally it said to draw the direction of the radiation. So that was the other one that I tried to do. And again, I did a little bit of hand waving. I was talking about the Lorentz force and the centripetal force, and I said that you know the Lorentz force had to be greater than the centripetal force. So I'm not very confident on either of those questions, but those are the ones that I attempted to solve. Uh, and the third question we were given, it was like, here's some ohmic material with a given conductance as a function of the position you know, find the resistance. And I wasn't too familiar with those kinds of problems, so that was the one that I opted out of. Uh, so overall, you know, I, I felt pretty good on classical mechanics and thermodynamics and quantum mechanics, but I'm sure here or there, there's some points missing in those three sections, and there's no way that I got full marks on the E and M. So I need six out of eight to get a 75 on the exam and pass at the PhD level. And the way it's looking, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't pass at the PhD level. I'm pretty sure that I did at least get the master's pass, but I just don't think, uh, I didn't do well enough on the E&M part to really make me feel confident that I'll get the PhD pass. We will see how it goes, but assuming that I just get the master's pass instead of the PhD, that'll mean that I do have to take the test again. Uh, but in the future, what that means is now I know better 
based off of experience what my real weak points are. I didn't know I was uh, not as good at electrodynamics as I thought I was. I guess I didn't really know what I didn't know. And um, I had kind of a surface level knowledge of you know problem solving with dielectric materials. Now I know I have to become much more proficient with those types of problems. So I feel good about the future if I have to take it again. I know what I need to work on more so than ever. I already have a nice set of comprehensive notes for me that I don't have to retake because they're already there. So I'm still hopeful, but I wouldn't be surprised if I don't get the PhD pass. Uh, I should find out within the next week or so, so I'll be sure to keep everyone in the loop. Sorry if this video was pretty detailed or and I'm not really having diagrams, so it's really just me talking physics at you, which might be a little frustrating to hear and not all that helpful, but it's just been a long day. I can't really put in the energy to have all of these nice equations and stuff popping up. I hope that you understand. But as for the rest of the weekend, I'm probably just going to be reading up on some quantum field theory. And then on Monday, since it's Martin Luther King Day, we don't have a uh, class on Monday. So I'm actually going to be going out to El Paso with some friends to see the new Dragon Ball movie, which I'm really excited for. Let me know in the comment section, what do you have planned for the weekend? And I'll see you guys there.